up throughout day four of Broncos training camp. It's back together Saturday and Broncos country sure knows how to come together as thousands have made their way inside the UC Health Training Center to celebrate the start of the 2022 season. General Manager George Payton will join the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater to discuss the state of the Broncos just a few days into camp. Then Nick Kosmider from The Athletic will tell us how the Broncos are beefing up rookie outside linebacker Nick Benito so he can make the biggest impact possible this season. And finally, three-time Super Bowl champion Mark Schlereth will join the smiling assassin to share what stands out most to him throughout practice. All that and much more coming up next. Welcome to Broncos Training Camp 2022 with Steve Adwater. Here's your host, Alexis Perry. Today is a very special day here at the UC Health Training Center as fans from near and far have made it out for Back Together Saturday, a league-wide tentpole event to kick off the 2022 season. Walking in, you can feel the excitement among these fans who are eager to get a closer look at this highly talented Broncos roster, especially their new franchise quarterback, Russell Wilson. I think we can all remember where we were on March 8th when we learned the news that General Manager George Payton had traded for the nine-time Pro Bowler, the Super Bowl 48 champion, and the 2020 Walter Payton Man of the Year. But George Payton, he was just getting started. He went into free agency and signed one big name after another. Then he went on to draft one of the greatest edge defenders in this year's class. And of course, he was able to bring back a couple of core players in Melvin Gordon and Kareem Jackson and to really cap things off and put this team in a position to really make it push for the playoffs. With more on the current state of the team a few days into camp, here's Steve Atwater alongside GM George Payton. All right, thanks so much, Alexis. Hey, we do have George Payton here. George, thanks so much for giving me a little bit of your time. You got my it, my pleasure. Yeah, all right, so second year as general manager of the Denver Broncos. What's the feel? I mean, what's your overall sense of everything right now? I mean, yeah, you, know, you get the hang of it. Well, no, you never get to yeah, get the hang of it, but we got a long way to go. You know, uh, it's been a wild year and a half or so. You know, we've uh, we've made a lot of changes, and uh, you know, I feel good about our team. You know, I feel we have a long way to go, and, and it starts you know today with this great practice we're going to have here in a couple minutes. But uh, real feel good about our team, the way they're working, uh, the way Coach Hackett and his coaches are teaching, and and the players and that we have a good mix of, of, of young and, and veteran players and and one thing for certain they all want to win and they love to work and they embrace that. Yeah. Well, in the building, the facility over there, the training complex, you got new carpet on the floors, you got new paint on the walls. Is, is that a coincidence or is that kind of a bigger theme of the change and the, the transition? You know, it's it's Coach Hackett's really, you know, he's, he's big on that. He's big on the, the building, you know, have pride in your building and, and he's very particular in what he wants. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we named him head coach, you know, and it's not just about the players. He's he, he wants the whole building to be in a winning, you know, with the winning building, you know, winning employees and winning staff. And so it's all about winning. And so he wants a first-class organization, so do I, and, and uh, we feel like we're getting there. Okay. Now, what does success look like? What, what would success look like at the end of the season, even if you just take away the wins and losses? Yeah, success is we're all playing together. We're a team. We're the best version of ourselves. We're, you know, we're all going in the same direction. We all know there's going to be bumps in the road, but how do we, how do we regroup from those bumps? You know, last year I felt like uh, when we got hit in the mouth, you know, we pointed fingers maybe at each other. And, and this year we need to stick together, you know, because this, this is a journey. You know, you get oh, yeah. 17 games and it's sometimes. not always easy. And shoot, you know, we, we need to stick together and, and uh, we need to work and, and win football games. Yeah. All right, so you second year uh, GM. You, you're going to be the most tenured of yes. uh, some of the leadership group yes. here. So uh, with that, Coach Hackett, new head coach, going to have new owners coming in yeah. shortly. How do you envision everyone growing together? I think it's an exciting time. You know, the, the, it's hard to believe I'm the vet of the group. Yeah. But I've, <laughs> I've been here one season, and we have a coach who's been here about six months, and we're gonna, we have an owner who's been not quite here yet. So it's exciting that we're all kind of coming in together. We can 
we can build it to our vision. I think we have a really good head start with Coach Hackett, myself, and all the great people and players we have now. And it's just, you know, the owners are going to take us to that next step. You know, you need great ownership to win in this league. And I feel like the Walton Penner group, they're, they're great owners. Yeah. And it's going to be really good. Well, speaking of the Walton Penner group, uh, you know, what do you envision, like from a 10,000 uh, foot level view, um, like what's your interaction has been like with them? And do you have a sense of what Broncos country should be expecting? You know, I th I've had uh, a number of conversations. You know, they're not here yet. So, uh, you know, my envision, you know, they're going to do whatever it takes to win. You know, they, they want to win. They want to win the right way. They're going to help set the tone of the culture, uh, not only in our building, our organization, but uh, out in the community. And so that's that's kind of how I see it. And, and uh, you know, they're going to take us to, to new levels. I know that. Well, you've had a chance to work with um, Coach Nathaniel Hackett here for several months. Uh, what's your overall take of him now? I mean, I'm sure you had an idea of what it would be like with him, but after being with him for several months, do you still feel the same way, or do you feel stronger? Or Yeah, I feel stronger. I mean, you're just with him day to day. Uh, the, not only the energy and, and everything he brings and kind of how he's retooled our building and the connection he has with the players and the organization, but he and I have great synergy. And uh, that's not always the case in organizations. You know, but the scouts, the coaches, the football operations, there's great synergy and there's great collaboration, and, and you need that to win. That's, you, need, you need that to have a chance to win. So it, it's been everything and more than I expected. I knew he was, had a great football mind, um, but seeing him in front of a room, seeing him in front of the players and, and uh, the day-to-day, -day, the minutia that not everyone sees, I couldn't be more impressed. Okay, well, I've seen Russell Wilson and Coach Nathaniel Hackett. Uh, great communication between the two of them. And it seems like Russell Wilson really has a lot of say. Uh, and really, a lot of the players, it seems like these days, are having more of a voice and a more of open uh, lines of dialogue between the coaches. Is, is that the, the, the new NFL now? I think you have to. I mean, you're going to go get a, a, a Hall of Fame type quarterback, and you're not going to listen to him. You know, <laughs> That'll but, mix this. I mean, these new players, you, you have to listen. They want to know the why in everything we do. And so, and I think that's, that's how you get the best out of the players if you empower them. And, uh, and Hackett, that's what he believes in. And, and, and it's all about the players and connecting. And uh, you listen. It's just not a one-way street. You know, you all have to be on the same page. And so you have to bring them in. It's a partnership. It's just not It's not church and state. You know, it's yeah. not. It's, it's a little different than it used to be when you played probably. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely was that way back when yeah. I played a little bit. But that, hey, that, was, that was okay, yeah, too. Yeah, it was good. Now, now Wilson, uh, when I see him again, videos, meeting him in person, he seems to just be a dynamic leader. How will his leadership change how the other leaders on the team, other guys are Justin yeah. Simmons, Cortland Sutton, Bradley Chubb, you know, how, how would they need to adapt or would, would, they, would it just mesh together? You know, I think it meshes. I think uh, when your best player is, is your hardest worker, that helps. It does. You know, it's, it's, uh, I've been places where the best player was not the hardest worker. But I think uh, the minute Russell walked in our building, it changed everything. It raised uh, everyone's game. And... Um, He's been in the league 10 years. You know, he's the elder statesman of this team, and everyone's looking up. Everyone's watching, and it's just not our team. It's the organization. He's raised the level of our organization. You know, everyone watches, and they see him here. And, they, and, it, and it's not, you know, it's just not talk. You know, he, he brings it. He brings it every day. I understand it 100% because I feel like I've gotten better since he's been here. Yeah, <laughs> he's we're all trying. I, I've up. gotten better. I know that. <laughs> I better be on my game, you know? Yeah, yeah, wow. Um, now, there, there are several players on the team who I think are looking to make that jump to the next pl next level. And uh, when I think about players, I think of like uh, Albert Okuwebunam. Yes. I think about uh, Dalton Reisner, Quinn Miners, yeah. Boyd Cushenberry, Michael O.J. Mudia. Uh, how do players, in your experience uh, as a GM, being in personnel, what do players need to do to make that jump from one level of play to get to the next level? Great question. You know, sometimes it's a scheme that can get them there. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, maybe uh, work a little harder. It's something that they're deficient in, you know. I just think a year, and these, these kids, these guys are young. They're in their 20s. You know, Quinn Miner's 21. You know, yeah. a year of strength, a year of experience. Came from Wisconsin Whitewater. Everyone's different. You know, everyone has a story. Pushing over trees. Everyone has a story, you know. And, and uh, even a guy like Reisner, who's been a good player, he's a vet. He can improve. He can get better. He can master a scheme. Um, but, you know, all, the good thing about all these guys, they want to get better. And so it's great to see that, that elevation from you. Pat Sertan. Yes. He had a great year last year. Yes. He looks better because he went home 
and he trained on the things maybe he needed to work on. So, um, as you know, that's, that's how these guys get better. Yeah. Now, when did the pads go on? Pads go on Tuesday, I believe. Tuesday. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of process-oriented, so I'm focused on today, but I think Tuesday is pads. Tuesday pads yeah, go on I, out you're, there. You're, All getting right. a, you're getting ahead of yourself. Uh, yeah. We got yeah. a big practice today. Uh, okay, but, yeah, big practice today. Yeah. How will things change once the pads go on, though? Because right now, and back when I played, uh, I would see guys when you don't have one the pads. Yeah. Like, oh, man, he's going to be great. And then once we get the pads on, the yeah. guy disappears. Uh, yes. No, pads are everything. You know, pads, preseason games. I, we try not to get too excited about what we see in shorts and shirts. And, and, we, and sh we haven't even had a personnel meeting yet. It's not, let's wait till the pads get on. That's everything. You know, how physical are you going to be? It's easy, you know, to, to take on a block now. And, then, you know, but when they get the pads on, that's when, you know, that's when the real deal happens. And so that's everything. And that's when you can get honest evaluations. This is great. You can see guys stick out, especially the some of the receivers, DBs, you know, yeah. the movement type stuff. But in the trenches, you really don't know until you get those pads on. Yeah. All right, George. Hey, it's always I a pleasure. I really appreciate it, my friend. Always a pleasure. You have great work. Okay, you and too. I, I don't know how you pulled it off getting Russell Wilson here, but thank you. We oh, appreciate you. Yeah, oh Rock goes country. Oh, back to you, Alexis. Thanks so much, Steve. Now as we turn our attention to day four Broncos training camp, I am so excited to be joined by Nick Kosmider from The Athletic, who unsurprisingly has had some outstanding coverage of this team all throughout the offseason, of course, through training camp so far. We will actually get to his most recent piece here in just a little bit. But first, we need to touch on yesterday's practice. A little bit interesting. We saw four jog-through periods from this team. So what does that really say about Coach Hackett and his staff and how they're going about things this year? Yeah, it's a little bit different than what we've seen. Um, I think we kind of expected to, this to still be the early training camp pace where you're just kind of installing everything and going fast, which for the first two days were extremely quick. Uh, but he, as he laid it out, he kind of wants to separate it into threes. You know, you go hard for a couple days, and then you have what he called kind of a body refresher in that third day where you get a lot of detailed work done, uh, but also give your body a chance to rest for what will be a more intense practice um, today. It sort of reminds me of, uh, you know, cross country when I was in high school. You taper down right before yeah. a big race, and so that's kind of what, what they're doing. Yes, DJ Jones, a tempo violator yesterday, but now today it does seem like things are going to be a little bit more intense. The fans are out here in full force. The guys are wearing spiders. So what do you think we can expect here today? Yeah, I think it will be ramped up from, from obviously what it was yesterday, but even from the first two days, yep. which were already uh, pretty quick. Nathaniel Hackett on, a, on Friday definitely seemed to suggest that uh, we were going to see the most intense action of camp so far today. And, and the competition, I think, is where you'll, you'll really see it today. Uh, battles on the outside, wide receivers, cornerbacks. Um, I, I think you're going to see a lot of that today. We'll also see Nick Benito trying to get after the quarterback as well. You know, he has shown flashes of greatness throughout his first three or four practices here as a pro. I know you had touched on in your most recent piece there for The Athletic, just some of the ways that the Broncos are grooming him to have a big impact this year. So what are, what are those ways? Yeah, it starts with getting stronger. That was the one thing that George Payton kind of laid out for him as a directive going into his rookie year. He played at Oklahoma last year at about 235 pounds. They want him at about 250. So okay. it's grabbing shakes, a lot more uh, snacks in between uh, meals, which he said is not something he's used to. He said, I don't necessarily like to eat a lot. I said, you have the opposite problem of me. Um, but, exactly. But he, uh, you know, so they're, they're doing that with him. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, just kind of really trying to add more protein to his diet and, and get get bigger because the talent is there. He, he's ready for that part of it. It's just getting ready for the physicality of the league. Yeah, we always talk about his burst off the edge. And, you know, he's been going up against some really strong offensive linemen. Actually, probably a few more faces than he was expecting to go up against here in practice given the competition on the offensive line. What are your initial impressions of that battle right now? Yeah, it's interesting. Nathaniel Hackett said that um, you're going to see a lot of different combinations. They're really serious about cross-training players at different positions during training camp. We've already seen uh, quite a bit of that. Um, there's really interesting battles at guard between Quinn Miners and Atani Moody. They're kind of splitting those early team reps. Um, and so that, that's one battle to really watch. You know, where does Graham Glasgow fit in as he comes back from his leg injury? We've seen him take snaps at center. Um, so I think that's what you'll continue to see the next couple weeks is guys playing in a different spot than you might have expected them to coming into camp. Right. Well, one guy who could speak to this subject quite well, as well as a number of other subjects regarding this Denver Broncos team is three-time Super Bowl champion Mark Schlereth.
Harris, who was up on the stage with Steve Atwater. Drafted by Washington in 1989, Stink played six seasons with the Redskins before joining the Broncos for another six years. A two-time Pro Bowler, Schlereth played in 156 games, many through injury as he helped the Broncos earn two Lombardi trophies. Since his retirement in 2001, Schlereth has been a familiar face as an analyst on Fox while co-hosting Schlereth and Evans weekday mornings on 104.3 The Fan. For his analysis of day four, let's send it on up to the Hall of Famer, Steve Atwater. Man, Mark, I got to say, I want to share this story um, with, our, with, the, with, with our fans here. Uh -huh. um, we talked a little bit about it beforehand. 1997 was the year. Um, we're in the playoffs. You saw some guys not really giving it their all, I guess, uh, in terms of you know showing up on time. Right. You know, we, we didn't have much of that throughout throughout our, our, our uh, tenure there with, with uh, Shanahan. But, you know, you saw that happening. What did you do? Yeah, well, <laughs> and I told I told Mike, I go, hey, man, I need to have a little players only meeting. And I was coming back from a back injury. I had uh, herniated uh, both sides of my L5S1, so I had a back surgery. So. I'm in there every morning at 5 a.m. just rehab, and I'm sitting in the training room. I'm missing meetings, you know, going through this rehab, trying to get back to so that I can help us, you know, when the playoffs roll around. We were a wild card that year, and, you know, we had lost a game to Pittsburgh. We had lost a game to San Francisco. We just weren't playing our best football, and sometimes you're kind of a fly on the wall in those situations when you're coming back from an injury. So I'm just kind of observing and watching guys run in the last seconds, fly into meetings still in their street clothes, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, I asked Mike, I go, hey, man, let me just let me just address the team. And so I addressed the team and I, I just essentially said, man, this is our team. You know, Mike Shanahan ain't going to make one tackle, ain't going to make, you know, one block. Yeah. This is our team. And when you show up late, you're basically saying, hey, man, my time's more valuable than your time. Yeah. And I go, and that, that's not that's not championship caliber. Yeah. And so and then I also brought uh, one of my Super Bowl rings. The first time I ever brought out a Super Bowl ring. Man, you um, did me in with that one. Well, boy. it was the only one I had at that point. And, <laughs> and I was like, you know, guys, this is like this is something that we're we're fighting to get. And we kind of you know, this is like, again, this is our team. And so I did that. And then a bunch of other guys ended up speaking. And uh, and from that point forward, you know, I came back for the playoffs and uh, and it was an incredible wild card run for us as the Denver Broncos winning that first championship. Well, I got to tell you, when he passed that Super Bowl ring around and we were able to touch it and hold it and man, that, that did something to me. I'm not sure. I, I would imagine it did right. the same for a lot of guys on the team. That was that was so inspiring. And that made us, I think, have that have that. Hey, we got right. to get this done now. Compared we got to get our stuff together. Compared to the Super Bowl rings of today, it was like me passing around my uh, high school class <laughs> ring. <laughs> like <laughs> they, right. hey, they don't quite look the same as they do today. Those things are absolutely uh, um, ridiculous. They're amazing, and hopefully, this football team under the leadership of uh, Nathaniel Hackett and uh, Russell Wilson, hopefully, this football team can. Uh, that's, bring a championship back to Denver. That's exactly where I was going to go next. Yeah. Uh, with the moves that uh, George Payton has made over the offseason, bringing in new coach uh, Nathaniel Hackett, uh, upgrading some positions, in particular the quarterback yeah. position. What do you see? What do you look at? How, how, what's your outlook for this team for this year at well, this point? Yeah, I look at this team as a playoff football team. There's going to be some growing pains. You know, there, there's always – because when you have kind of guys that are, are doing things for the first time, first time play calling and all those things and, you know, meshing with your quarterback and really finding out, you know, what you like, what you don't like. And, you know, this is a former player is um, you don't know what you don't like until you're in a game and somebody beats you on it. Right. And so you're like, man, I hate being in that situation. And so they're going to grow together. And they'll take this offense, this West Coast offense, and they'll amalgamate kind of what their philosophies are, and they'll grow together. And that just takes time. And, and you can't just do it in training camp. It's going to be a process through the first five, six weeks of the season. It was interesting, you know, as I call games for Fox, talking to Tom Brady in their Super Bowl year, the first year he went to Tampa. You know, they were, at, at one point, they were 7-6. and six, And they right. went on a run and never lost another game. And it was really interesting talking to Tom because he goes, we're not like we're not. And, and also Bruce Arians is like we're right now in the uh, in the dating phase yeah. of of getting to know one another. And this is four or five weeks into the season. They're like, yeah, we're, we're just in the day. We're not married yet. We're, yeah. You know, we're dating and we're thinking there's potential there. And so it takes some time for everybody to get on the same page and hopefully 
Um, hopefully with the way they're practicing right now and the things they're doing and the teaching that's going on, not only on the practice field, but in the training room, or excuse me, in the, in the film study room, um, hopefully they get on that, pay, on that same page quickly. Yeah, at what point during the season does a team really have a good feel of, hey man, we got a pretty good team, we, we can go deep, we can make something happen. Yeah. Because I, I would imagine you've been on some teams where midway through the, se midway through the season you're like, man, we're, I don't know if we're going to, Right. I don't think we're that good. Yeah, there, there's always that reality of kind of where you at or where you're at and, and what it takes to win. And I think one of the biggest things um, is kind of championship pedigree of the quarterback, also Nathaniel Hackett coming from the Green Bay Packers. I think there's a lot over the last five years when you're a team that can't get over 500, you can't quite make the big play at the right time. Um, there's this sense that, hey, I think we're working hard or we think we're working hard. We think we're studying. We think we're preparing. We think we're doing all the things right. And then a dude like Russell Wilson comes into the building and and, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, shoot, I got to pick <laughs> it up. Right. I'm not I'm not doing all that truly is required to play at a championship level. And I had that in my own uh, my own experience. I was always a preparation guy, always studied, played with the Hogs, you know, won a Super Bowl, did all those things. But I lined up next to Gary Zimmerman in practice, and I was like, oh, shoot, I got to pick up my pick tempo. Up. Yeah. I got to pick my tempo up. Yeah. Um, because of the way that guy practiced, he just flew around. And that was a real mainstay of Mike Shanahan in the early years. We practiced, even when we didn't have pads on, it was full speed, no pads, let's go. And I've seen some of that here in the first couple of days of camp that I've been watching. Yeah, I mean, do you think some people may take that for granted about Russell Wilson? Uh, now, we know he's an accurate passer. We right. know he's been uh, available. And that's, they say one of your best abilities mm -hmm. is availability. He's been available. Um, he, he's a great leader. But what he does off the field, the, the, the model that he sets for the rest right. of the guys on the team, do you think that can be overlooked sometimes, the importance of that? Yeah, I think uh, I think you, you overlook it unless you have it. And then when you have it, you're like, oh, this is what it looks like. And, you know, it's funny. I did the first game of the season. Um, it was a Seattle at Atlanta game in 2020 during the COVID season. And I'm always picking people's brains about how they prepare, right? Because I'm always looking at, hey, what do you do to prepare? And can I steal something from you to make me a better broadcaster or me a better radio host or whatever the case may be? And so I went to Russell. I was like, well, take me through your week. Walk me through how you prepare to get ready for a game. Because I want to see if I can steal something from him, right? right. And he's like, well, as soon as this game is over, I'll get on the plane and I'll watch the broadcast copy. So I'll watch what you guys have to say and I'll listen to the game and just get a feel for the game. Then I'll watch the coaches film on the plane. So I'll spend two hours on the plane watching the coaches film. I'll, I'll critique every step I took, every drop I took, every throw I made, every protection I re re -miked, whatever, right? And I'll go through the whole thing. Then I put that away and Monday, I start breaking down tape. You know, I break down situationally, uh, third down, third down two to six, third down and, uh, you know, three minus, third down and long, second down and long. I'll go through base. I'll go through all those things. Then I'll go through blitz versus dog versus whatever. And so that's Monday and Tuesday. And then Tuesday night, I'll write up a 15-page report on all the stuff I studied, and I'll hand it to the, or I'll email it to the coaches in my receiving group and everybody else. Wow. And so you're, you're like, I'm like, <laughs> I walked out of that meeting going, man, I ain't accomplished squat in my I gotta life. Pick like, it up. I, I got to pick my stuff up, right? <laughs> but that's the detail. And so. If your quarterback is willing to put that kind of detail in, and you know that that position, it's more is required of you. Um, I, I think you can't help but it intensify the pro the process that you go through as a player. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that 100. percent And I think most players realize that the quarterback is probably the most important position on the field. Sure. And then when you throw in the the fact that the guy is a heck of a leader, mm -hmm. uh, you know, great family guy, great role model for these guys. Uh, that's just the, you know, the icing, yeah. icing on, on top of the cake. Uh, hey, Mark, I want to talk about some of these offensive linemen we have yeah. here. Uh, first off, I want to talk about uh, Graham Glasgow. Mm -hmm. where, where do you see Graham at? Uh, he's, in his, he's in his third year with the Broncos right. now. Uh, has some injury issues the past mm -hmm. couple of years. What do you think he has to do to take that jump to get to the next level to where the coach can feel like, hey, I know I can rely on this guy. He's going to be there. He's going right. to be available, and he's he's a, he's a steady player for us. Yeah, you know, I mean, Gra Graham is a steady player. He's a very smart player. And, you know, one of, the, one of the values, and I know they reworked his contract, but one of the values of a guy like that is 
Uh, that's a guy that is very smart, really understands the system, under, understands the protections, understands everything about it. And there's a dude that you could say, hey, listen, man, even if he doesn't come back to, to full pace at this point, or we want to work our younger players in there, uh, like Quinn Miners, we want to work in Mutai, um, you know what we can do with that guy? We can make him an inside swing guy. Mm -hmm. And this started really, you know, I mean, you think about all the things that, that Mike Shanahan was an innovator of. One of the things that he really did, and he was really the first person, I think, to, to do this, first coach, is start, started dressing seven guys. Mm -hmm. And we used to always dress eight guys, and Mike was like, well, let's dress seven guys. We can get an extra special teams guy out there uh, that, that may make a difference for us, and our extra receiver, whatever the case may be. But when you dress seven guys, it means you're starting five, go, and then you got one dude to play swing tackle, mm -hmm. both sides, and one guy has to be able to back up guard all three yeah. guard, center, guard. So in our time with the Broncos, we had Harry Swain, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a swing guy, or Matt Lepsis as a swing guy at the tackle position, and we had Dave Diaz and Fonte. Yeah. And that's incredibly valuable to have that. Um, and so that's one of the things that, uh, even if he doesn't become a starter again, um, he, he still has incredible value. Yeah, being able to play both, right. both guard positions and, and also the center, the center position. position. Correct. All right, what about Dalton Reisner? Uh, guy, he, he's uh, in his third year. Mm -hmm. um, his third or fourth, third, third year, I believe, for Dalton. Uh, Dalton, I think, first couple of years, and I think this is, yeah. I think Dal this may be Dalton's fourth year. I think it is fourth year. Well, yeah, Dalton's fourth year. Okay. Uh, First first year was a very strong year, I thought. Uh -huh. Last couple of years, I think the play dropped off just a bit. Right. What about him? What, what does he need to do to prove to the coaches that, number one, he can play this outside zone run scheme, which you're a master of? Uh -huh. <laughs> what does he have to do to show the coaches that, hey, I'm the guy for you for this position? Right. It's just about consistency. It's, a, it's about consistency, and it's also about – you know, being really aggressive. I mean, you know, I think there's this misnomer that, hey, we just want light athletic guys and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna reach guys and circle guys and, and all this stuff. And, you know, when I consult for different teams around the league, it, it really is about creating leverage. It's really about coming off the ball. It's really establishing a new line of scrimmage. And, you know, even when, when we played here together, Steve, I think people thought like when they played us, we were a finesse team. I think the Packers, when we beat them in the Super Bowl, thought we were a finesse team. And we will roll off that ball and shorten your neck. And there's a little bit of a, um, a narrative out there that you got to be lighter and you got to be, you know, quicker and you got to be all these. Things. No, you just have to understand how to create leverage. And leverage is created through technique. So I just think Dalton has to really focus on that technique and really coming off the ball and establishing himself as a real physical player. And those are the things. Um, that will resonate with his coaching staff. You see Calvin Anderson there uh, on the on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a guy who's going to have an opportunity to compete for that starting uh, right tackle position. What do you like about his game? I, you know, I, I really like his. He's really good sets wise. He has a good strike. Um, you know, and, and those are things to me that are always really important. How do you use your hands? How do you strike? How do you how do you use your feet? And then it really becomes from a technical standpoint. Um, how do you set guys up? I always talk to, to teams about funneling people, taking them where you want them, inviting them somewhere and having them go there, understanding your help, understanding, you know, how to how to actually block people without actually um, without actually always having to do it from a physical manner, using, you know, from the neck up, being able to block people. So those are things that um, that as you progress as a young player and you start to understand the, the intricacies of the game and you start to understand the game better, um, you can take a lot of stress and a lot of pressure off yourself just through leverage, just for understanding of where my help is, where the back has to release, do I have a tight end, like uh, is the tight end motioning across the formation and giving me body presence so I keep an inside set. Just a lot of things that, that you got to think about right before the ball is snapped and if you can play that way, uh, you can really make yourself a much better player. Yeah, wow. That's interesting uh, because I know as a defensive player, I, I know a lot. I had to go through a lot of thoughts in my mind. I just can't imagine on the offensive line all the different things that you guys have to think about. You got to worry about guys blitzing. You got to worry about you know make sure you're on the same page mm -hmm. with with your your fellow linemen. Uh, but that that's awesome. Um, another guy I wanted to talk about quickly. A guy, he's a rookie. 
uh, don't know how much he's going to contribute this year. Luke Wattenberg, uh, they have him at center. I think he'll probably be able to play, play mm -hmm. center and guard as well. But uh, he's a guy, 6'5", 300. Uh, what are the challenges for a rookie coming in, learning the center position one, which right. I think is, is that, would you say that's the most difficult position along the offensive line? Well, I think outside, you're protected on both edges, so those tackles. I'm talking about just in terms of learning. Go you know, From learning, yeah, from the, from the neck up, yeah, absolutely, because, um, and I don't know how, how Nathaniel Hackett will do this, but, you know, from us, from my perspective, um, up front, we were always in charge. And there's kind of two different philosophies. Let your offensive line be in charge of protection calls, re-identifying mics, and doing all that stuff, um, and take that off the quarterback's plate. And then there's some teams that just want that on the quarterback's plate. So, um, but you have to be able to recognize the fronts. You've got to be able to recognize um, the safety rotations, where linebackers line up. And, you know, there's always a tell. Um, if you study enough so based upon where guys line up the positions they get in it'll tell you who's blitz and who's not blitz and who's in coverage and all those different things so be able to read all that stuff understand and, and remember what the play is what you're supposed to do what your responsibility is and then think about as as you line up and you shift and you motion what happens to the defense they shift and they motion and when they shift in motion and, and they change positions right it you know, you re-identify the strength. Well, now all of a sudden the blocking scheme changes. So you have to be able to communicate those things. You've got to be able to talk to one another. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, mental gymnastics that uh, basically start at the center position and pass its way down the line of scrimmage. I think, that, I think the offense has an advantage in that regard, just in terms of when you guys motion, when you don't motion. Because I believe the teams that motion put much more stress on, mm -hmm. on defenses than teams that they come out in the formation, they just line up and they run the play yeah uh, because defenses we have to adjust and many times guys on the defense they aren't familiar with if a guy goes across and then comes back yeah they're lost yeah <laughs> yeah no there there is you know it goes all the way back to mike martz in his days on the greatest show on turf with the st louis rams um they really they ran more shifts and more motions than any team in the national football league at that time and we played them in a, in a tight game remember we played them up in we opened up, I think, the season up there in maybe 2000, and it was like a 40-something to 30-something game. You know, yeah. it was it was something. But um, bottom line is they shifted and they motioned more than any team in the National Football League, and they were the least penalized uh, procedure team in football. So they really worked on it. And really what it does is it gets guys on their heels. You know, if you can get the defense communicating, you can make them have to make multiple checks at the line of scrimmage. Um, it's great for the offense and, and you think about this and this is what like the really good running games like the San Francisco 49ers do they'll present to you a play mm -hmm. and for them it's the same play let's call it 19 handoff right and they'll say hey what we're going to do is we're going to enter our fullback front side then we're going to enter him all the way to the back side then all of a sudden he's going to slide across the formation he's going to be in charge of the weak side linebacker and so you basically change one guy's entry point and one guy's responsibility. Uh, other 10 guys are doing the exact same thing they do on every play. But to the defense, the you same. just made it look like like five different plays, yeah. right? It's, it's all different. And so little things like that um, to make a defense communicate is, like you said, to the advantage of the offense. Yeah. Well, what are uh, – take a look at Kendall Hinton here. Um, I saw him – Unfortunately, drop one, put one on the ground the other day. Mm -hmm. Guys like Kendall Hinton, I think, uh, with the depth that we have at the wide receiver position, I think they got to make sure they take advantage of every opportunity to catch those balls. And not, you know, he hasn't dropped many balls. That's, that's one of the few right. that I've seen him drop. But uh, man, we got a got a deep wide receiver room. Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, KJ Hamler, Jerry Judy, uh, Travis Fulgham will get a chance to see, see what he can do. Mm -hmm. Tyree Cleveland. Uh, Trey Quinn, Kendall Hinton, and Seth Williams. Would yeah, you, you like the competition there? Yeah, I, I do like I do like the competition, and there is a, there's a there's a ton of guys. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're gonna have to you're gonna have to show out to make it on this roster. But I do like that competition, and um, I also I, I'm also looking forward to seeing, you know, Cortland Sutton, um, like 
him coming off that knee injury in his second year now. He's not wearing a brace. Those That's big to me, right? I want to see him compete yes. for those 50-50 balls and do the things that he does. Play big. You know, he's a big guy. Play big. Tim Patrick, to me, is one of the, one of the best football players. Forget about position. He's just a good football player. Really want to see Jerry Judy. Um, you know, we all talk about the explosion. We all talk about the route running. We all talk about those things. Well, now it's time to put it together, right? Now it's time to... Now, don't drop balls and, and you know, and, and basically put those things together. And the other thing is is, is the timing of the routes and all that the, with Russell Wilson to be on time, be out of your break on time so that you uh, have an opportunity um, to make big plays because we know that that kid can make some big plays. But, um, you know, it's, it's time for those guys to really live up to the potential. We've been talking about the potential right. of how good this receiving core could be. Now it's time, time to show to it. Show it. All right, Mark. Hey, this has been great as always, my friend. Thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Always uh, good to see you at. We're going to get back down to Alexis. Take it away. Thanks so much, Steve. Broncos country, London is calling. I am so excited for you guys to have a chance to participate in the London raffle. It is an amazing opportunity to win a five-night stay in London for the Broncos week eight game at Wembley Stadium up against the Jags. You guys, this is first class round trip tickets for two, a behind the scenes experience at Broncos practice and on game day and so much more. This trip is valued at over $22,000. And all you have to do is go to broncosraffle.com. One ticket is $50, three for $100, eight for $200, and 25 tickets for $500. The best part about all of this, the proceeds benefit the Denver Broncos charity. So head to broncosraffle.com right now for a chance to win. Just a reminder there, you must be 18 or older and in Colorado to play. Well, Steve, the Denver Broncos, they just wrapped up a two-hour practice here in their spider. So we saw a little bit more physicality. And given the fact that all the fans were out here today for Back Together Saturday, I think it's safe to say that these fans were fully entertained. Yeah, they were fully entertained. It was a great practice. I thought the guys were crisp. Uh, everyone knew where they were supposed to be. I didn't see a whole lot of mental errors. And the guys catching the passes that are thrown to them. So it's a beautiful thing. The fans, the energy was great. Uh, ben McManus had a good time kicking balls over in, uh, into the audience. So uh, great day. One guy who had a great day as well, Jerry Judy, him and Russell Wilson, their connection is apparent. He is spending some time in those quarterback meetings. I think it's safe to say he's paying off. Yeah, it's definitely paying off uh, with him you know, knowing the offense, and he, he had already known the offense pretty well from yep. speaking to some of the players on, on the offensive side of the ball. But him going into the meeting rooms, knowing exactly where he needs to be, uh, I think is paying dividends for him because they've been targeting him quite a bit, and that's been uh, different from what we've seen in past years. Jerry Judy, not the only Broncos wideout with a solid connection with Russell Wilson. Check this out. Late in practice today, Russell Wilson, he steps up into the pocket and drops a 60-yard dime right into the bread basket there of the rookie Montreal Washington. Steve, you love to see it. You gotta love it. Montreal Washington, known for his punt return skills, is also a talented wide receiver, a speedy wide receiver. I think he and KJ Hamler are gonna bring an aspect to this offense that we haven't seen, which is that burner speed where when you get on the field, defensive backs say, I gotta back up a couple steps. Well, one guy on the defensive side of the ball that had a fantastic day. The second year guy, Pat Sertan the second. This guy is unbelievable. He's looked like a veteran in this league since the moment he arrived. And that was on display again today. He had a beautiful pass breakup on Cortland Sutton, of course, a near interception on Tim Patrick. Just how good is Pat Sertan, Steve? Yeah, well, it's almost frightening because uh, we know that he's just in his second year. And I think some people could take for granted how difficult it is to have a good yes. young cornerback, a guy who has his entire career ahead of him, and him to be playing this well this early. Uh, we are definite, definitely fortunate to have him on the team. He's right where he's supposed to be every single play. He's honed in mentally and physically. He can play with the big guys, and he can cover the small guys. He's a top, top tier corner in my book. Ronald Darby had a great moment today too with a pick six as well. Overall impressions of Darby and maybe even K1 Williams. He looks great out there. Yeah, well, both of these guys, um, well, K1 Williams, I think, had a successful year last year in yep. San Francisco. Uh, Ronald Darby, uh, I think he has a few things to prove. Last year, he didn't have the best year. Uh, and I, I think Broncos country wants to see 
what Ronald Darby can do, and I think he'll have an opportunity to show the fans that he's a playmaker, and he did that today with that pick six. Any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Well, I, I think Broncos country uh, are, are going to go home and have a nice off day tomorrow, just like the team will, and have a good feeling in their hearts that they know that this team is out here working hard. Uh, the coaches have a good plan for them, and uh, we're going to win some games this year. We are going to win some games. Hey, what's your prediction? I know you're probably not ready for that question right uh, yet. Uh, a little early in camp. Right, uh, what, 12 and 5. Okay. See, I was 11 and 6. 12 so and 5. 12, 12 and 5. 5 is good. Yeah. I love that. Well, I am so sad. In, in the toughest, toughest conference. Yeah, toughest conference, toughest division. I totally get it, Steve. Well, thank you so much. You and Mark Schlereth, absolutely outstanding. You and George Payton, amazing stuff today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, AP. Appreciate you. Well, I am sad that we will not be out here tomorrow as the players will get a much-deserved day off, like Steve mentioned. But they'll be back on Monday. And according to Coach Hackett, in full pads as early as Tuesday. They'll work through Saturday. So if you won't get, weren't able to get out here for Back Together Saturday today, we really hope to see you guys out here next weekend. They will then wrap things up with a joint practice with the Cowboys on Thursday prior to their first preseason game against Dallas, Saturday, August 13th. So still plenty of opportunities to get out to the UCL Training Center over the next two weeks. If you can't make it out, don't worry. We have you covered with analysis of each practice day right here on the Broncos YouTube channel, DenverBroncos.com, and the Broncos 365 app. A quick programming note for you guys. This show will now be posted at 5 o'clock Mountain Time each day. Now, as for our next show, be sure to tune in on Monday as we're going to be joined by another former Broncos offensive lineman, Orlando Franklin. That's all the time we have for Broncos Training Camp 2022 with Steve Atwater for the Smiling Assassin, Stink, Nick Cosmiter, and our amazing crew behind the scenes. Thank you all so much for watching. We will see you on Monday.